Okay, I think we are live. Is anyone out there? Um, it took me a while. It took me two minutes just watching this uh, circle go around and around. So I think I am now live. Um, thank you to everyone. Ah, hello. Hillary Gadsby is first one in today. Thank you to everyone for joining me today for Find My Past's Facebook live sessions. Uh, let's see who is here. We have Hillary Gadsby. We have Linda Robertson. We have Pancho Slowey from Glasgow. Sally Palmer joining us from Dublin. William Shore says hello to Fiona and everyone else. Hey, William. Georgia Draper is joining us from a rainy Canvey Island. Gosh, it is. It's a little bit overcast and a little bit dull today. Fran Jones says hello. Pauline Cobain says hello from Belfast. Mobo Barton White is joining us um, in from Linden. Anita Ryan McGarrah says hello. And Nancy Tangler, great to see you. Ellen Montessi Zarnik is joining us from Roscoe in Illinois. Anne Robertson says hello to everyone. Mary T. Crowley, a regular from Derry City. Um, Cheryl Sullivan Sharp Wildner is joining us from the lakes of the shores of Lake Huron in Michigan. Susan Wolfe says hello. Jackie Stevenson. Angela Roney. Um, okay. Jean. Heyer Hegarty says hello from New Jersey and Helena Groves. Misty Cray Maloney is joining us from Boise in Idaho. Now, I want to make an adjustment to the sound, if you just bear with me. Now, is the sound better? Okay, Rosie Murrells joining us, says hello to everyone. Dennis Brazil from Dublin. Uh, let's see who else is here. Tess Martin. Tess Martin is joining us, so is... Tess Martin is from Rotterdam. Janet Moore -Watkin Watkins from Essex. Aaron Waters from Florida. I hope it's sunny where you are in Florida, Aaron. Um, Sharon L. Hewson, good morning, joining us from the USA. Maureen Kerrigan joining us from rainy Glasgow. Wendy Hampson from Sussex in the UK. Clayne Hildebrand there. It says it's beautiful where they are. Anya Nithimos joining us from Boston. Bhaskar Ma, hello again. Via Gwip. Oh no, in fact, Anya is joining us from a very damp Fife. Apologies. Says hope everyone is well. William Shore says it's rather damp in Cumbria too. And Mark Worth from Lincolnshire. Now, I recognize many of the names of people who have joined me today from the regular five live sessions that we do in the Irish Family History Center every Friday. Um, thank you for joining me today for the Find My Past Facebook live session. Now, I have a number of questions that have been sent in, but if you would like to ask a question in the next hour, please enter your question into the chat box while we are live. I don't have a magic wand. What I try to do is to recommend the next step in your research or the sources where you're likely to find relevant evidence or the methods that you might use to trace individuals or families. So let's get started. I'm going to move between the questions that have been sent in to us in the last few weeks and cross over every now and again to answer questions which are coming in from questions which are coming in uh, on in the text box. OK, I have turned all I've turned the volume on everything up loud. So I hope the sound is receiving you loud and well. We're going to start with a question from Gerald. Gerald doesn't say where he is writing in from. He says, how do I trace a Patrick Leary, born in the first years of the 19th century, joined the British Army and served in Corfu about 1833, Cork in 1837, and Castlebar in 1839, Castlebar in County Mayo. 
He says he has service dates and locations based upon the births of Patrick's children. Gerald says, if I could work out the regiment, I would be able to make some progress. I don't know where Patrick, one of my third great grandfathers, was born, but I suspect it's in County Cork. I've drawn a blank for him over 20 years. I'm also desperate to find out any details of his wife, my great grandmother times three. Many thanks. Well, Gerald, if you have the children's birth, then what I would recommend doing is check out the children's births on the British Army, the registration of births, deaths and marriages. Um, and these are available online on the Find My Past website. In fact, once they were put up, it kind of changed the way that we research army families completely. Um, if you have the children's birth records already, look to their birth certs. It should give you the name of Patrick Leary's regiment and also his wife's name. Now, I double to check this so that I wasn't giving you the wrong information by looking at documents for my own family history in the same decade, the 1830s. And sure enough, the wife's name and the regiment are, they should both be there clear as day in print um, on the children's birth records. It's the British Army Registration of Births, Deaths and Marriages. Um, and you will find those on the Find My Past website. Okay, next question coming in from Mags. Mag says, hi Fiona, I have a dead end. I just can't trace further. I'd love to know the birth details. She has a John Caldwell who married Anne Dempster in Glasgow in 1835. And she says on the marriage entry, it says he was in the 77th Regiment. In the 1851 census, they have my great, great, great granddad, Thomas Cox Caldwell. And John is recorded as being a soldier born about 1800 from Ireland. In other words, there's no specific locations, and that's made it nearly impossible to trace John any further. Now, Mag says by the 1861 census, John has disappeared, and Anne is listed as Mrs. J. Caldwell, with only her child Thomas, so still no further clues. She asks, do you have any suggestions of how I could try and track down John's birth? Hey, Mags, that's an interesting question. In my experience, the minimum information you need to find somebody in 19th century Ireland is their name, the decade in which they were born, and the name of at least one, preferably both parents. Now at present you have two out of these three. So how do we find the name of John Caldwell's father? Well, I looked at the 1835 church marriage, but it gives no evidence about the marrying, marrying pair's fathers. It doesn't say what the bride or groom's own father's names were. So I think what you might do is look at the naming pattern that is used in the family. In Ireland, there is a very strong naming tradition and it's followed by people of all backgrounds and from all different faith communities. The eldest son is named after his paternal grandfather, the second son after his maternal grandfather and the third son named after his father. And this is presuming, of course, that there's no repetition between these names. So if they married in 1835, presumably they had children before Thomas Cox Caldwell in 1851. So I would look at the parish registers on the Scotland's People website to see if I can pick up any other children born to this couple. But I would also look at the data set, British Armed Forces and Overseas Births and Baptisms on Find My Past. And again, looking for all births registered in the name of Caldwell after 1835 and before 1851. Now, I didn't have time to follow through on this myself, but I did take a quick look. And I found some interesting looking births there, including for Jean Caldwell in Limerick City in 1837. So two years after your great times three grandparents married in Glasgow. Now, this Jean Caldwell's father was in the 70 se 72nd Regiment. And um, there's also a James Caldwell born in Portsmouth in 1845. And remember as well that men were often moved between regiments. 
particularly over maybe um, the kind of time frame you're looking at is almost 20 years. So Mags, I think that's your homework if you are willing to take it on, to check out the British Armed Forces and Overseas Births and Baptisms on Find My Past and start calling up those baptisms and hopefully you'll find exactly what it is you're looking for. Okay, before we take any more questions, let's take a quick look to see who else has joined us. We have David J. Johnson from Scotland, Rosemary Tones from Woking in Surrey, Lynn Lawson is joining us from British Columbia in Canada, Mary Jones from a cold and overcast Cape Town. I'm sorry to hear that, Mary. Erin Waters says it's getting a wee bit chilly here in Florida. <laughs> Not like it is here in Dublin, Erin. Um, Lloyd, fine at Sir Devere Hunt. What a great name. Many of my ancestors attended Trinity College. Lloyd, the Trinity College alumni lists are published on Find My Past. Alumni Dubliniensis is the data set. So if you want to look at some of those ancestors who attended Trinity College, Dublin University as it was at the time, check out the Alumni Dubliniensis on Find My Past, see who you find. Mary Ann Miller is joining us from South Boston. Royston Jones, with a name like that, you have to be from Wales, and he's, he says he's from the Rhonda Valley. Mary McFadden says, hello from Greenock. Great to have you with us today, Mary. Um, let me see. Kalane Hildebrand says, my maiden name is Ormsby. We have Irish and Blackfoot, Native American. Fantastic, mix. Nikki Doyle says, Cavan County, the Harton. Is that Harton or Martin family? Sue Kelly, glad you could join us. Erin Waters. Chris Vanderkar, hello from Dundee. Uh, that's somebody I haven't heard from in a long time. Rosemary Tones, my question is, are Prony Records online? Rosemary, unfortunately they're not. There's a very small number of databases, mainly wills and uh, records of freeholders, um, the 40 shilling freeholders who had the right to vote on the, on the Prony website. But the greater number of their records are only available in hard copy. And right now you have to make an appointment uh, in order to attend Prony and to look at the hard copy records. Okay, let's take another question that has been sent in um, earlier this week. The next question is coming from Patricia. She's looking for the Clune surname. And she says, searching for Clune in County Clare is like searching for Smith or Jones in the USA. Well, Patricia, this seems to be more of a comment than a question. Um, I took a quick look on the Find My Past website and there are 9,000 individual records for the name Clune in County Clare on that site. Now, what this boils down to is, are you a glass half full or a glass half empty kind of a person? On the one hand, yeah, it's a lot of records to work through. <laughs> on the other hand, it's a lot of records to work through. Draw up a profile of your ancestor or your ancestral family that you are tracing and use it to focus in on which, if any of these 9,000 are relevant to your family. Ask yourself, what is your ancestor's approximate year of birth, even the decade of their birth? Do you remember I said the key things you, you need to have to trace any individual in 19th century Ireland was their name, the name of one parent, and the decade in which they were born. When and where do they marry and to whom? If you can find a marriage record, it can often contain evidence of the person's father's name, his occupation, if he was alive at the time of his son or daughter's marriage. I love marriage records as well. I like to see who stood as the witnesses, the best man and the bridegroom. That tells me much more about the couple who were married. Um, the valuation office records are also the backbone of Irish genealogy, and they can allow you to trace how long your ancestral family remained in the district, using tax records after 1830 and continuing to the 1980s. Now the valuation office records are available online on Find My Past. These records cover the time frame 1830 to 1865. And the second valuation office survey, Griffith's Valuation, 1847 to 67 is, sorry, 1847 to 64 is also available on the Find My Past website. So Patricia, gird your loins, girl, and get searching. Let's look to see who else has joined us. Sue Moon Warner, there's a name I am familiar with. Great to have you with us this afternoon, Sue Moon. Rosie Murrow, 
Jean Hare Hegarty. Um, she's looking for ancestors from Northern Ireland. I would love to trace them. Any suggestions? Well, Jean, what I just recommended to Patricia would probably be pertinent to you as well. Start by drawing up a profile. What decade, preferably what year, are they born in, in the 19th century? The name of the individual, the name of one or both parents. Do you know where in Northern Ireland they were from? Do you know what their faith community, what church do they attend? Catholic parish registers are indexed and digitized and available online now. Um, not so the Church of Ireland or Presbyterian or Protestant dissenter records, with the exception of Quakers. The entire Quaker archive for Ireland, North and South, has been digitized and put online. It's available exclusively on the Find My Past website. So start by looking to your family. Who are they? Set down on paper names, dates, occupations, years of birth and marriage and death. Um, and once you have those, that can be a focus for your research. And Psyche North Tarek, that is a good recommendation for you as well, tracing your ancestors in County Tyrone. Welcome to Pat Bowles. Pat, you're not too late, don't worry. Glynis Cox Millet Kay, Clay is joining us from South Africa. Fatima Malji is joining us from Birmingham. Fatima, great to have you with us today. Susie Gallagher says, I believe my great grandparents came over to England on a boat. Well, Susie, unless they swam, um, I don't think there would have been very many airplanes uh, going between Ireland and England. Um, taking a generation as 30 years, great grandparents would be four generations ago or 120 years ago, which would bring us back to 1900. So boat really was the only way to go at that time. Um, Yvonne of Sullivan says, do you have any information or origins of the name Caus, C-O-U-S-E? My husband's grandfather said it came from France and originally the name was Delacousse. Um, Yvonne, the surname certainly occurs here in Ireland, but it's very definitely a minority surname. And by that, I don't mean it belongs to an ethnicity. I mean, it is quite an unusual or rare surname. I would have said it was of European origin. Beyond that, I can't easily say. On the plus side, there is a benefit to searching for a rare name in the Irish records, in that when you are searching, it tends to jump out at you from the records. Let's take another question that was sent in to us during the week. The next question comes from Margaret. She's searching for Edward Hugh Barron apparently born about 1796 in Ireland, and he joined the British Army. Well, I examined the British Army service registers on the Find My Past website. Now, once this was published on Find My Past about a decade ago, it was an absolute game changer. Um, suddenly we began picking up a huge number of Irish soldiers, young men who enlisted and who had a career in the British Army. It's estimated that in the 19th century, 40% of all recruits um, originated in Ireland. Now, in a sense, that's almost disproportionate, a disproportionate membership of um, young Irishmen joining. Um, but great from our perspective in that young guys who wouldn't have been so easily, they wouldn't have been so visible in the records, not so easy to find, that now we can actually search for their service records. Now, I found an Edward Barron of the 10th foot. Edward Barron began to receive an out pension on the 12th of August, 1840. And he was admitted as a pensioner on the 1st of January, 1876, dying on the 20th of April, 1883. Now, what this tells me is that he would have had to have been in the army for at least 10 years before he was eligible to receive an out pension payable to him in his residential accounts. Um, in 1876, as an old man, he is admitted to live in Chelsea Hospital, the Royal Hospital in Chelsea, and he dies in 1883 there. So this is good evidence. It tells me that the man we are looking for, it tells me that we can search for a civil death record in 1883 in the UK records, and hopefully that will have his age at time of death. I would suspect that when you find that death, 
you will find that his age is 1796, was certainly to within a couple of years of either side of that date. Um, with that evidence, you might further search for Edward Barron's service record and find out more about where it was he was posted to uh, during his term of service. Um, the name Barron, by the way, would tend to indicate descent from one of the Norman lineages, if it's Gerald's in Tipperary or Kilkenny. And if you search for a baptism, uh, look particularly in the counties of Tipperary or Kilkenny on the Catholic parish registers on the Find My Past website. And Margaret, here's a tip. Don't just look for Edward, which is the name that he went by in the British Army when he lived in the UK. The name was more commonly recorded as Edmund um, here in Ireland. OK, let's see who else has joined us. Ward and Moors, Tracing Irish Links. The name Ward is one of the oldest um, Irish family names. It comes from Mac on board, the son of the poet. Uh, Moor, there's a number of different origins. There's a number of different places where Moor could actually come from. OK. Now, how is the sound? Is that OK? Um, let me see. D. Clark says, hello from the Scottish borders. I'm very interested in all the border arriver Scots who were encouraged by James the first and the sixth to move to Ireland. Um, D, I seem to spend a large part of my professional career tracing these very same Scots. And in fact, I found in the last, um, well, I, I did more research to actually uncover my own Scottish heritage coming from precisely these lowlanders who uh, settled in Ireland during the Scottish plantation. There are some records, um, mainly for the mainly for those people who received the larger grants of land in the 16th century. Um, but by the time you get to the early 1700s, there are other records which are also um, available for the greater number of people, including people from a much more ordinary background like my own. So in other words, a lot of what, what you're going to find depends on someone's class background and the kind of resources they have access to. If they got a large grant in the plantation, they should be, in, they should be visible in the records from the 16 teens and 20s and 30s onwards. We begin to see the middling kind in the muster rolls from the 1630s onwards, and then um, in occasionally in other similar kinds of records. But we don't see the greater number of people until the early 1700s. OK, Find My Past is saying hello to everyone. The sound seems to be working fine at our end. Turn up your volume to the highest level and try with earphones if you still can't hear. Guess who? Well, Mick Gavin, that can only be you. Welcome. Great to have you with us today. Angel Gabriella says hello from Christine Hewish in West Yorkshire. Uh, William Shore says my 11th great grandparents are my link to royalty. Uh, William, that's a claim to fame. Um, <laughs> is it something you can dine out of? That's the question. Claire Shannon, okay. Uh, Claire, I'm very sorry that you're disappointed with the sound. Some people have said to me that what they like to do is to stream these sessions through their television and to adjust the sound accordingly. Okay, let's take another question sent in to us during the week. Miriam says, I have two brothers who stated on the UK census and on their police applications that they were born in Barisacane, County Tipperary in 1834 and 1836. Their names are Thomas and John Redding. Now Miriam says, I've linked up via DNA another brother, Matthew, who emigrated to the US in 1862. Their father is Matthew, according to Thomas's marriage certificate, his UK marriage certificate in 1857 in Birmingham, uh, tells us that the father's name is Matthew. Now Miriam's question is this, how do I find records of their baptisms? So far I have drawn a blank. 
and she is joining us from South Australia. Well, Miriam, the name is more commonly Redden, R-E-D-D-A-N, in the Tipperary records. Now, I used the professional genealogist trick of searching for the most uncommon name among the three brothers. And in this instance, it was Matthew. So I was looking for a Matthew, son of Matthew. I searched on the Catholic parish registers on the Find My Past website, and Matt Redden pretty much jumped out at me. He was baptised on the 19th of October, 1834, to parents Matthew Redden and Honor Quigley in the parish of Terry Glass. And Terry Glass is the parish that adjoins, that borders Boris O'Kane. So we are in the same neck of the woods. Now, although I had a quick search in the index, I didn't find a baptism for John and Thomas. This doesn't mean that they weren't baptised. It's simply that it would have simply been inconceivable not to baptise a Catholic child at that time. What this simply means is that the indexer didn't capture their names. So you are going to have to carry out a fingertip search of the parish registers. They are free to access online on the Find My Past website. Um, they're also available on the Ancestry site, but behind a paywall. OK, Wendy Hampson is saying the sound is very good. I'm glad to hear, Wendy. Uh, let me see. Uh, Rick Oxley says, I'm sorry I'm late. I'm currently getting it to two. Rick, that's quite extraordinary. Do you have, are you tuning in to us from the tattoo parlor? Um, well, best of luck with that. <laughs> that might be an interesting, that might be something interesting to see if you want to actually take a picture and send it into us later on. Fiona Blair Watson says, my great grandfather was Professor John Wardell at Trinity College. He wrote volumes of the economics of Ireland. Do you know anything else about him, please? Fiona, if you key in the name John Wardell into the Irish records, you will actually find a wealth of information. Wardell is one of those lovely names in an Irish context in that it's quite unusual. Um, and I think that almost everyone that you find with the Wardell surname in Ireland will be fairly closely connected, either the direct family or connected within two to three generations, first and second cousins. So in a sense, it's really a matter of starting the search, your own research, and then joining up all the dots and seeing where the different Wardell family members fit in. Um, Fiona, going to, you're going to have great fun doing that. Like I say, it's an unusual name in an Irish context. And it's one of those names that you can't, you can't mess up too much with this, you can't kind of stick in an extra cons consonant um, or you can't replace um, an A for uh, an I, for example. So it should be a fairly straightforward process to research your great grandfather. Um, Val Murphy Ashford, hi there, very glad you could actually join us today, Val. Uh, Lynn Marie Alex says, are the customary individuals in a family chosen as sponsors or godparents for baptisms? Lynn, that's a good question. Um, the quick answer is no. There are no customary individuals. Sponsors or godparents were supposed to provide a spiritual guide for the young person being baptised. So it's certainly possible that people didn't choose an older sibling if they were going to emigrate overseas for the simple reason of distance. Um, so in some ways, there are more customs around who not to choose than who to choose, if that makes sense. But otherwise, the individuals who are chosen as sponsors, as godparents, are the immediate family and the closest friends um, of a family. Um, so that's something always to, that's one of the reasons why I always like to see who are the godparents, because that allows me to start looking at a family in a wider context of their community. Who are their closest family members? Who are their closest friends, their kith and kin? And you will find that those strong friendships endure even after families emigrate um, overseas. OK, uh, Ornery Tomas is saying a family history tattoo. Well, <laughs> I'd be curious to see what that looks like. Daphne Hannam says, hello from a wet Somerset. 
I have my computer speakers right up. I can't hear properly. Daphne, I'm terribly sorry. We have checked the sound. Everything is good here on this side. And we are, um, I'm speaking right into the microphone. Hello to Emily Moore. Emily is another one of our Friday afternoon regulars. Um, William Shore, okay. He says he has to, his settings automatically go low, so he has to keep, he has to turn it up. Now, Graham Roberts asked, is it common to list persons buried in a different location on another gravestone? For example, on the north side of the stone lieth the body of Anne, the wife of Timothy Roberts, who departed this life, 1845. Also, Timothy Roberts with a date of death. Um, Graham, I think that sounds like a level of economy, um, a level of economy that is unusual and also very, very precise. I've never heard of something quite like that before. What I have found, though, it's very, very common in Ireland, is that the name of a son or a daughter who may have emigrated overseas is named on a parent's gravestone. And um, you might often find also John Moore of Boston um, or um, Michael Redgrave of Philadelphia, for example named on the parents or on their siblings gravestone and um, in a sense it's a sense of close family ties even though the um, the siblings may have left may have settled overseas okay ricky oxley says he is getting a remembrance to two lots of his family were army or navy and i'm still serving ricky that's as good a reason as any that i've ever heard so well done. I'd like to see that too, though, uh, at some stage, if you don't mind. Ita Wall says, hello, joining us from a very cold Dublin. It is Ita, but you know what? We've had a fantastic, lovely, sunny um, week up until today. So we can't complain too much. OK, let's go to another longer question sent in during the week. Um, Chris writes, I would love to know the name of Emily's husband. Emily Wilson was born in Carlow in 1858. She married possibly in St. Pancras in 1901. At the time of the 1911 census, she is living with her sister uh, in McMahon Street, Dublin, as a widow. Um, her name is Belle Ayres, Emily Belle Ayres. She says, I have never found the marriage and I have no idea what year. Um, on her death certificate, it says that she is Emily Belle Ayres, the widow of High Sheriff. Now, Chris in Perth uh, writes, I have never, I've been searching for 30 years. I would love to know who was Mr. Belair's and where was he high sheriff of? Chris, I searched marriages for the UK, for Scotland and the Isle of Man. And I found no evidence they married that Emily Wilson and Mr. Belair's married in any of those jurisdictions. Now, what this tells me is that Emily Wilson probably married outside of the UK and Ireland. She may, of course, have married in um, Jersey, the Channel Islands. At the time of the 1911 census, Emily Wilson Belairs was widowed, living with her married sister, Georgina Webb. Um, I searched. I came at this sideways because Chris has contacted me earlier this summer and asked the same question. And we found nothing at that time. So when we didn't find any result by going at it head on, I decided to chip it away at it, to chip away at it from the side and to see what I could find. I started by searching for the marriage of Emily's sister, Georgina Wilson. She married in 1900 and her marriage record shows that her father was George P. Wilson, auctioneer. I traced the civil death of George P. Wilson, 62 years, hotel proprietor and auctioneer, and he died on the 28th of December, 1895, in the clubhouse in Carlow. And the informant was his son, Richard Elf Wilson, Richard F. Wilson, also of the clubhouse. Now, using the newspapers, the British newspapers online, which are bundled into the Find My Past subscription, I searched the Three Man's Journal and I found death notices for other members of the Wilson family. For Elsa, for Emily and Georgina's sisters, Isabella Olivia, who died in 1896, 
and for a brother, George, the eldest son, who died also in 1896. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm chipping away at this, I'm circling, and I'm inching my way forward and getting closer all the time. But the key thing that I've proven is that Emily's father, George P. Wilson, was a prominent individual in Carlow. He was a hotel keeper and he was an auctioneer. So I think, Chris, what you need to do is to search the local newspapers for a marriage notice of his daughter. If a local grandee's daughter married the high sheriff of any place, you can be guaranteed there will have been some that the local newspaper will have carried a story. Newspaper editors publish stories relevant to their community of interest. So use the British newspaper archives and I would focus in on the Freeman's Journal or possibly any of the Carlo newspapers. And do let us know how you get on because you've sent this question in a few times now and we've got a little bit closer this time than we have before. So I'd love to see. It will probably take about another half hour or so of research to actually get an answer. But I would love to hear what that answer, what the answer eventually is. So good luck with that, Chris. Okay, next question is coming from Mary Ann. She writes, how the heck do I find Michael Quilty, son of Dennis and Margaret Quilty, born about 1806? I've been looking for years. <laughs> Mary Ann, you haven't given me much information to work from. So I did my best. Now Quilty is a real County Clare name. I would expect the family were originally from there. The difficulty is going to be tracing any record that allows you to connect the child's name, Michael, with the parents' names, Dennis and Margaret, in or around 1806. Because there were surviving parish registers for almost every Catholic parish from the 1830s onwards, in the decade after Catholic emancipation. But we don't have a complete survival of registers for the first decades of the 19th century. Now, Mary Ann didn't mention if the family stayed in Ireland or if they emigrated overseas. If they stayed in Ireland, then she is going to have to focus on tracing a marriage record for Michael Quilty. And she'll have to start looking at um, the names of Michael Quilty and his wife's children. Start trying to um, draw up a profile of the family and see what further evidence she can squeeze from the records. If, however, Michael travelled overseas, then I think Mary Ann's best bet is to develop what we call a reverse genealogy. There's very often a more complete survival of records in the country of immigration than there is in the country of origin. Gather every piece of evidence on the immigrant ancestor, the ship's manifest, emigration or naturalisation records, the census every time he or she appears in the US or the Canadian census, their will and probate records, a church or a state marriage record, the death or burial record, a newspaper notice of the person's death, of the Irish born person's death, will often say where in Ireland it was, the exact place that they were born, the county or even the town or village. Um, look too to the naming patterns of children. So Mary Ann, that's the best that I can do on the limited evidence you gave me, but good luck with that. And I think you do have ways of actually developing this research a little bit further, trying to push it forward a little bit. OK, let's look at other questions coming in in the chat box. Um, Margaret Bartley says, hello from Spain. How do I find a coroner report from a suicide in 1922 in Gower and Kilkenny? Margaret the coroner's reports should be in the National Archives of Ireland in Bishop Street. Now you can write to them to request a specific record. If you have the death record of, if you have the death of the person who committed suicide, uh, you have their date of death and you, that probably should be enough, the name and the date of death um, and the fact that it was in Kilkenny. Um, you're probably going to have to wait till the National Archives reopens and then you can either hire a researcher um, or if you are inclined to visit, you can visit Dublin and do the research yourself. 
If you want to hire a researcher, the Irish Family History Centre has a panel of researchers available to take commissions. Okay, Pauline Cobain says the sound is perfect. Thank goodness for that. Uh, Megan Bogley says, has anyone ever found marriage records in Cork area parishes before 1820? She's looking for a record of her third times great grandparents. Megan, the best collection of Cork city and county marriage records is available on irishgenealogy.ie. That's what I would use if I was looking for a marriage in or around 1820. Okay, Peter Combs says, my wife's mother was born in County Mayo. Her name was Bridget Agnes Reynolds, born July 1914. Is it possible to trace anything from that? Peter, it should be. If you go on to irishgenealogy.ie and look at the civil records, you should be able to find a birth of Bridget Agnes Reynolds. Once you find the birth, you can click on the link and open up the original record. And that should give you the name of both her parents her father and her mother's maiden name. Once you have both parents' names from the child's civil birth record, you can search for the parents' um, civil marriage record. Given the date that she's born, 1914, I would also take a look at the 1911 census for the family. And you start to work out from that starting point, that 1914 civil birth record. Okay, D. Anderson. Uh, oh no, she's replying to somebody. Um, let's see. Phil Batten says, okay, the sound is good. That's good to hear. Um, Megan Bogley, I'm looking for my Peters family. The US Census says that my second great great grandfather came from Ireland. We have no other information. Megan, start on your side of the Atlantic. Start by building up a profile of the family using the American records. And this is very much what I have recommended to others um, earlier in this session. Build up a profile of the family in the country of settlement. There's often a more complete survival of the records and the person is better document, documented in the country they settled in rather in where they were born and grew up in. Once you have that good information, then you can try and move your search across the Atlantic to the Irish records. And the minimum information we look to trace anybody in 19th century Ireland is the name of the individual, the name of one, preferably both parents, and their date of birth or even the decade in which they were born. Those are the three things we look uh, th that we like to start from to have a reasonable chance of finding somebody in the Irish records. Hello to Ethel Mary from a very rainy Epsom in the UK, she writes. Lynn Lawson writes, my three times great grandparents were Richard Rennick and Christiana Mallow. She has a marriage record for them from 1830-31 in Clonus in Monaghan. Her father's name was David. I haven't been able to find any other information in Ireland. Sometime after 1843, they immigrated to Scotland. The next document I have is their son's marriage in 1857. Uh, she can't find them in the 1851 Scottish census. Um, do you have any thoughts on where I could find information for this family? Um, Lynn, I would be curious to see where Rennick and Maddell, Ren Richard Rennick and Christiana Maddell married. If they married in a Catholic church, then the marriage record should be available online on the Find My Past Catholic Marriages. Um, if, however, they were Church of Ireland or if they were uh, Protestant dissenters, None of those records have been digitized and indexed. So you're going to be thrown back on looking at other records. Now, if you know that Christiana Maddell's father's name was David, I would search for a David Maddell. Maddell is one of those lovely, unusual names that will jump out at you from the records. Given the time frame when they are marrying in the 1830s, I would look particularly at the valuation office records to see what you can find. It should be possible to actually find the um, place of, to find, the, to find David Maddell's, um, where, where was it, where did he live? And to say quite a good deal about um, his living conditions, his circumstances, and possibly also including how much land he might have had based on these land tax records. And these are available exclusively on the Find My Past 
website. Let's take another one of the longer questions. Carol, I'm looking to trace my great, great, great grandparents. My great, great granddad was Samuel or Samuel Brewster, she believes, a fisherman in Dunseverick in County Antrim. She knows part of the family emigrated to America, but she thinks they may have returned at some stage to Antrim. The records are very hard to find. Um, her great-grandfather was Samuel Brewster, married to Alice. They had six daughters. My grandmother was Jeannie Brewster. Any help greatly appreciated. Well, Carol, you didn't give any dates or decades, but assuming 30 years for each generation, then your great times three grandparents are five generations, and five times 30 is 150 years. So in other words, we're presume, I presume we are searching for a couple born in or around 1870 born about 1870, and probably married in the early 1900s. Now, I searched online on irishgenealogy.ie, and I found what appears to be the correct marriage in Ballycastle, County Antrim. Married by licence in the Church of Ireland, 12th of March 1902, Samuel Brewster, a fisherman living in Dunseverick, to Alice Scott of Temple Thaw. Samuel's father was James Brewster. Alice's father was Robert Scott. Both of them were fishermen. We have witnesses, Archie Gault and Hesse Lyle Cunningham, the best man and the bridesmaid. Given the names, probably not, certainly not siblings, could be cousins, but certainly these are the closest kith or kin of the young couple. Now there's very many ways that Carol can develop this. I traced backward and I found Samuel's civil birth in 1872. Born 15th of November, 1872, Samuel, son of James Brewster, a fisherman of Dunseverick, and his wife, Margaret May Rourke. Now you could develop this by going to look and see what other children were born to Samuel, sorry, to James Brewster and Margaret Rourke, and when did James and Margaret marry? Or you can trace it forward in time. I did that and I found Samuel Brewster in the 1911 census in the townland of Curry Sheskin in the district of Dunseverick, County Antrim, living with his wife, Alice and four daughters. You might also want to look at the passenger lists leaving the UK uh, between 1890 and 1960. And again, these are available on FMP. So I think, Carol, safe to say there is eating and drinking. There is enough to keep you very occupied there for quite some time. Um, a huge agglomeration of records which are available on the Find My Past website and an irishgenealogy.ie and which will help you to trace your family forward in time across the Atlantic and um, but also backwards in time to try and get an earlier generation or generations. Let's take another longer question. Donna writes in saying I'm searching for my second great-grandparents Michael Keenan and Mary Keeney. They emigrated to Cleveland, Ohio in the 1870s. Their eldest daughter was born in 1880 in the Cleveland area. She has US documents for the two of them, giving a wide range of birth dates. Michael married any time between 1847 and 57. Mary likewise, any time between 1850 and 57. Now given that these are very common names, um, Michael Keenan and Mary Keeney, we need to actually try and find a much more precise date of birth for both of these. Now Donna writes, I have significant DNA matches with the Keeney surname from the Killipoo Parish and my ancestry DNA indicates southwest Donegal, but she cannot find a marriage record in Ireland or the US. She has all their children's certificates and marriage records, which simply say the parents were from Ireland. The family was Catholic, the diocese isn't releasing information. Do you have any suggestions, asks Donna, for further research? <coughs> Excuse me. Now, Donna, this isn't a straightforward proposition. I searched and I found no civil or Catholic church marriage and no records of baptisms in the Irish Catholic registers. Now, by the time we reach the 1870s, the records are fairly complete in Ireland. So this negative finding would make me wonder if Michael and Mary actually married in the US on arrival, particularly given that their eldest daughter is born in 1880. 
by that time I would have expected to actually find, if they had married in Ireland, I would expect to have, I would expect to see the record, to easily find the record in the indexed records, records which are indexed and published online. So it makes me think that Michael and Mary married in the US shortly after they arrived. The family name Keenan is found in the greatest numbers in, in southern Ulster, in counties Fermanagh and Monaghan, whereas Keeney is found much more often, much further north in Derry and in Donegal. And this seems to be supported by the DNA evidence you claim. So I'm afraid, Donna, I am going to have to recommend that you go back to the sources in the US and focus on a reverse genealogy to draw up a profile of the family. The census record should also tell you when they married and when they immigrated to within a couple of years. What you could possibly do is use the naming patterns of their children to try and determine what are the names of Michael and Mary's own fathers. And then with that information, you might come back to the Irish records and look for the baptism of Michael, son of X, Mary, daughter of Y. Um, now, and I saw a question there in the chat box asking, what is the naming pattern for daughters? Well, the naming pattern is actually an adaptation of the one that I've just described to you. The eldest daughter is often named after her paternal grandmother, and the second daughter is usually named after her maternal. Now, for some reason, the naming tradition of girls isn't followed through as consistently as it is with boys. And um, don't ask me why. Possibly it's because boys carry the father's name and the father's name is carried by all the children. And therefore they want to actually keep the paternal grandfather's name going. Um, but that is a supposition. Um, Let's take another question from the chat box. Okay, let's take a look. Bar Porin says, earphones help the sound. Fiona Blair Watson says, thank you, the sound is very good. Glad to hear it. Uh, hello from Ontario, Canada, Deborah Spicer. Uh, Margaret McCallum says, I've been told my great, great grandfather was a cobbler in Dublin Castle. How can I find anything out about this? Margaret, unfortunately, you can't find any central records for Dublin Castle, but you can look at civil births, marriages and deaths after 1864 and Catholic parish registers after 1830s. Um, there's an almost complete survival of records for Dublin, so I would think you've got a very good chance of tracing your family, your great, great grandfather, the cobbler, in those records. Ros Bull says, looking for the parents of Thomas Lane, born 1824 in Limerick. Any hints? Well, Ros, if the family are Catholic, I would jump directly to the baptismal records, the Catholic baptismal records. If they're not, I would look for a marriage record for Thomas Lane in the hope that it would tell me the name of his father. If Thomas Lane emigrated overseas, I would look for his civil death record. Lauren Lecura Bonner says, how far back does the Irish census go? Lauren, there hangs a tale. The earliest complete census that we have is 1901, followed by the 1911 census. For various other reasons, accident, um, most of them accidental, the entire, almost the entire 19th century census was destroyed, either in 1922 or the 1861 and 71 census were destroyed because the questions they asked were um, very sensitive, sensitive information about um, hereditary and about a family's medical history. And the only way the government could secure agreement to ask those questions in the census is if they destroyed the original evidence once they had taken it for medical reasons, for epidemiology. OK, let's look at another question. We're going to finish with a quick run of questions. So my motor mouth is going to kick in here. Louise writes, my late grandfather was born November 1933 to Mary too. He used his father's surname, Davis, throughout his life. He 
He was born at a place called St. Clair's Villas in Rath Drum. Was this an ordinary residential address or a convent? I would like to find out the details of his baptism. I don't know where to look. How can I find this? Louise, this appears to be a residential address. I looked at a commercial directory for the 1930s. Now, you didn't say what, what religious faith your family was. However, the local Catholic parish is Rath Drum. So contact the parish secretary to ask if you will search the baptismal register for your grandfather's baptism. And the contact details are www.rathdrumparish, all one word, dot i-e. Um, Marie writes, Hiya, I'm in Australia. My question is, how can I find information on a solicitor? William Brown Esquire, solicitor of Rutland Square, Dublin in the 1830s. He was a cousin of Count George von Brown. I can't find their connection. Is there a way of finding out where he went to law school or if there's any family information on him? Marie, there's a number of ways to approach this. If you don't know where he got his legal education, I would say leave this for a rainy day. That's going to take an awful lot of digging to track down his law school records. You'll have to look at the King's Inns here in Ireland, Trinity College records in Dublin. At least they are available online. The English courts, the inns of court, for many young Irish men were educated to the law. Now, if Brown was from a Catholic family, and the connection to Count George von Brown seems to indicate this, it's also possible he may have been educated on the continent. So what I'd recommend is leaving aside the education for the moment. If you know when William Brown died, you could search for a newspaper obituary. As a city lawyer and connected to Count George von Brown, a celebrity of the 19th century, William Brown would have had a public profile. It's very likely there's an obituary that will tell you more about his family. Now, there's also a registered pedigree of the Brown family in the genealogical office. NLI GO Manuscript 176 PP 157 to 65. That is a pedigree of the Brown family. And Count George von Brown was born in, seventh, in the, 17th, the, mid cent, the mid 1700s. He was the son of George Brown, general in the Imperial Russian Army. Uh, Johann George von Brown himself was a brigadier general in the Russian Army. And in 1794, he moved to Vienna with his wife. He was a patron of Beethoven in the early days. Katie writes, I've recently found my granddad's grandmother played a huge part in his life and died in a fire in 1948. I would love to find something more about her. Her name was Kate Kinsler. She died in County Leash. There was apparently an inquest into her death. 20th century coroner's records survive from most Irish counties and are held in the National Archives of Ireland. The coroner's registers relate to deaths for which inquests were held. Files on all deaths survive from the 1930s. Many of these files have post-mortem reports, and they also have a unique insight into the circumstances of the person's death, usually through a police report and depositions of witnesses. Now, all records after 1930 are under restricted access, but you can apply, Katie, to access as um, Kate Kinsella's next of kin. Let's finish with two last ones. Sue, my husband's family were trainers from Bailey Borough and County Cavan. I can't find any records for his great-great-grandfather, Nicholas Trainer, born 1805. Sue, most Catholic registers start in 1830, the decade after Catholic emancipation. We don't have complete registers for the first decades of the 1800s. Look at Nicholas and Mary's family to try and discern a naming pattern. The eldest son is usually named after his paternal grandfather, the second son after his maternal grandfather, and so on. So if, for example, you find that Nicholas and Mary's third born son is Nicholas, then the family probably followed this tradition. I did find a baptismal record for a Nicholas trainer in 1806 in Rathkenny, County Meath. Now that's within 30 kilometres of Baileyborough. This was to parents Peter Trainer and Catherine McGinnis. So that is a strong contender, Sue. Um, I think we will finish there. I have more questions and I may come back to you on another day to try and answer these and any further questions that you send in. Uh, thank you to Audrey Collins who tells us that tattoos are often described in army or navy service records under distinguishing marks, but she once found a navy record with a sketch of a tattoo and the lady she was helping recognised it as one she remembered seeing on her grandpa's arm, so she knew we had the right record for him. 
Audrey, what a fantastic story. Karen Maris, great to have you with us. And Karen asks for Robert Ward from Oxford, born about 1810. Uh, Karen, that depends very much on whether he was Catholic or Church of Ireland. Um, Church of Ireland records start earlier, but they haven't been digitized and placed online. Okay, we have now hit the hour. So I am going to wrap up there. Can I say thank you to everyone for joining me today? Um, it's lovely to see so many familiar names um, and fantastic as well to see people who I haven't previously come across and also to see a couple of um, a couple of others like Audrey Collins and Chris van der Kaar, uh, who I have met on my genealogy journey in the past. Um, if you haven't had enough of genealogy Q&A yet, you might like to join us with the Irish Family History Centre Five Live on Friday afternoons. We're there on the Irish Family History Centre Facebook um, and it's 90 minutes of questions and answers. Thank you once again to Find My Past for hosting me. Thank you to Niall Cullen for acting as moderator. Uh, and thank you to you guys for joining me this afternoon and sending some really interesting um, questions and comments. Uh, and thank you to everyone to the feedback you have given to each other. Um, I see that a number of uh, separate conversations have actually um, started in the text box there. Okay. Thank you to everyone, and I am going to finish here, um, and I hope that you will join me again. Best wishes now.